Hello and welcome to another video from Robert Shree Photography. What I want to talk to you about today is the Fuji GX617 Panorama Film Camera. This is an amazing camera. It is film and there, it's no longer manufactured by Fuji. The really exciting thing about this camera is that it shoots three frames of 120 or 220 film all with one exposure. So the film actually covers almost the entire back of the camera once loaded. And as you wind through, you shoot three exposures at a time. So on a roll of 120, that's four total exposures. On a roll of 220, that's eight total exposures. So you go through film pretty fast with this camera, but if you're accurate with your metering, then it takes an amazing photo. The Fuji optics are incredibly sharp and a little forgiving as to focus. Uh, so uh, I have seen very few cameras with as much sharpness and clarity as these Fuji optics. I would compare it similar to Leica in its, uh, in its uh, sharpness. Not quite as good as Leica, but close. But I love shooting this camera. The real benefit of being able to shoot with a GX617 is that if you're in an environment, let's say a landscape environment or a wedding environment where things are moving within the frame, being able to shoot three frames at once allows you to have a full exposure, panoramic exposure of the entire scene, although things are moving. So when you try to stitch together something with a digital SLR or a medium format digital camera, the issue you have as you move, as you shoot through the frames, if a tree is moving or a person is moving or an animal is moving, if it's caught between frames, you have trouble stitching those images together because it can't line up or you get problematic stitching. With a panorama film camera, since the exposure is three frames all at once, it doesn't matter if something is out of the ordinary within the image because you don't have to do any, st any stitching. All you have to do is scan the transparencies after you get them back from the lab. So I really enjoy that about it. Uh, I've tried to stitch together where trees are moving in part of a frame and a part of a landscape scene, and it be can become quite difficult in Photoshop to clean that up. So this is a way to capture a landscape panorama exposure with objects moving within the scene without any difficulty. And that's what I like about it. Plus, when you shoot Velvia 50 Fuji film with this camera, it's just amazing the outcome at, at uh, sunrise or at sunset. So let's take a look at what we have here. We have the Fuji GX617 panorama camera body. This is it. Um, it's probably about three or four pounds of weight. Uh, it's not too bad. It's a mixture of plastic and aluminum. Uh, is what it feels like to me, but it's it's a good balanced camera body. Uh, it also has a tripod mount. I actually bought a really right stuff bracket, uh, quick release bracket, so I can, uh, or, or not quick release bracket, but a plate that I mount on the bottom of the camera, and that way it works really good with all my really right stuff gear, uh, ball head, and quick release clamps. Uh, I also have the Fuji. 90 millimeter lens and you can see this one here and I also have the 180 millimeter Fuji lens which is quite a bit larger than the 90. You can also purchase a 105 millimeter lens and a 300 millimeter lens. I chose the 90 because I'm a landscape shooter and I want as wide of a exposure as I can get of the scene. Uh, and the 180 is a good medium telephoto that I can use for uh, mountains when I need to get pull the mountains in closer or when I need to pull a sunset in closer. Uh, I would be interested in the 300 millimeter as well. The 105 millimeter, not so much uh, of interest in that lens simply because it's so close to the 90. I don't really see any, any need for having a lens that close uh, in focal length to the 90. The other thing you have to remember with these lenses is they do require a center filter, uh, which 
The reason you need a center filter is because the camera is so wide that you have quite a bit of fall off as the image reach, reaches the outer edges of the film. So it reduces the exposure in the middle to help balance out the exposure on the edges where you have fall, out, fall off. Uh, you do lose two stops of exposure with a center filter, or at least with this one you do. Uh, there may be other ones where you lose more or less. But that helps balance out the full uh, film exposure so that you don't have dark corners. And it works extremely well. Uh, you'll be amazed at the results, but you do have to take into consideration to up your exposure by two stops, either in shutter speed or in f-stop. Uh, or aperture in order to accommodate that change. If you throw a polarizer on front of that, which I've done many times to reduce glare, you have to take into consideration how many stops you lose for the polarizer as well. So what I do is I meter for the scene with a Sekonic spot meter, light meter, and I, so I meter for the scene. I usually select various spots within the scene to meter. I determine the range of stops usually between sky and the darkest shadows and then I determine my starting point and then I add stops for the center filter and for the polarizer to come up with what my exposure needs to be. I typically if the scene is really important to me to capture correctly I will usually use all four exposures of a 120 roll to bracket the shot. Uh, typically I am shooting at a distance, so almost all the time I am focused to infinity. Uh, I actually pull back from infinity just a little bit for hyperfocal hyper focusing, and it tends to work extremely well with this camera. But uh, I, I've only shot a few times close up subjects, and I actually measure off the distance and dial it right in on the focus ring, and it comes out perfect. Another way of focusing is with ground glass, which comes with the Fuji GX617. If you're buying a used GX617, uh, you need to check with the seller and make sure that the ground glass does come with it. But this little piece mounts to the back of the camera and you can actually focus with ground glass prior to uh, exposing your scene. I don't do this. Uh, some people do, but I don't. Typically my scenes in almost every case are focused to infinity. So it's an easy camera to use, you just have to think about what you're doing. You have to think about your, your range, your dynamic range of your scene, where your, what your high points are, or what your highlights are, what your shadows are. Find a, an exposure that will balance in that range, accommodate for your center filter, and accommodate for your polarizer, and then go ahead and expose. And then I usually shoot one more stop above and one more stop below, and then if I feel like the scene may be dark, I may shoot another one where I'm overexposing a little bit more. Or if I feel like the scene is a high key scene, I'll underexpose another stop. So I wind up with four exposures at the end. I take that roll out and I move on to the next scene. I rarely shoot 220. I kind of like to load up a roll and use it and then move on. That way usually each scene is on a roll. Now if there's an extremely high dynamic range scene, I might pop in some 220 and bracket further, but I like to try to keep each scene to a roll. And I usually, when things come back from the lab, uh, they come out pretty nice, extremely nice actually. There are a few little quirks about this camera. When you first load the film, it's important that you make sure this plate is set to 120 if you're loading 120 film. If you're shooting 220, this plate comes off and flips over for, eight tw for 220. Uh, so you have to make sure you have this plate set correctly depending on the type of film you're using, 120 or 220. The other thing is as you load up the film and you wind it across, it helps to keep the, the uh, winding lever taut so that you don't get slack in the film. If you get some slack in the film and you close this cover, you could have some out of focus images because of the, the wrinkling of the uh, film within the, within the camera body. So it's important to keep things taut and keep it taut all the way to you close it and then cinch it on up and lock it down and then advance the lever. 
Now the other little quirky thing that's one sentence in the GX617 manual, but something you really need to be aware of, is when you advance from the first frame to the second frame, the, after your first exposure, it's important to press the shutter release button all the way down as hard as you can before advancing the lever. If you don't do that, what will happen is your meter or your indicator on the top that indicates which frame you're on will not advance. And that becomes extremely confusing because then you don't know how many times you've advanced the lever and you wind up with uh, shooting over frames and it becomes a real nightmare. So you don't want that to happen. But if you press that shutter release button all the way down after the first exposure and then advance the lever all the way and then you don't have to do it anymore, it will advance correctly and you'll see the number two exposure indicator uh, through the little window here. So that, that's a couple of the little secrets about this camera. Uh, it does have a leveler on the top. I don't pay a whole lot of attention to that uh, because uh, I usually try to level with my tripod and go from there. But, you know, different scenes require different angles and I may be angled up a little or down a little, which I realize this causes some other issues, but they're minimal if you're, if you're shooting with, say, a 90 millimeter and you're a pretty good ways away. Um, the other thing that you have to realize is that not only is it manual metering, in other words, you have to use a light meter or use the Sunny 16 rule or guess, whichever you prefer, uh, is that there is a viewfinder for each lens. So this is the 90 millimeter viewfinder for the 90 millimeter lens. This is the 180 millimeter viewfinder for the 180 millimeter lens. So what you do is, depending on which lens you have or which lens you're going to use for that shot, you just slide in the viewfinder and now you're set to shoot. Mount it on your tripod and see your scene. There are lines within the viewfinder that show the area in which the film is going to be exposed or of, of the scene that's going to be exposed to film. So you do have to load up the appropriate viewfinder. You do have to manually focus and you do have to manually meter and then adjust your, your, your aperture and your shutter speed on the lens itself. It's pretty simple to do once you get, a, get in the rhythm of it. There is a little locking button that you press down to unlock the viewfinder to take it out of the camera. Now a lot of times what I do with these little viewfinders is when I walk up to a scene that I know I want to shoot, I'll take this viewfinder out and I will, I will look at the scene through the viewfinder without ever getting the camera in the back, out of my bag. So a lot of times I carry these viewfinders separately and when I walk up to a scene I just pull it out and look at it. Okay, which one do I need to, to use here, the 180 millimeter lens or the 90 millimeter lens? and it works out really good. Uh, the other thing you need to realize too is you have to put the lens on before you load the film and you can't change lenses once film is in the camera. And the reason why is this is a real simple camera. It's pretty much just you mount the lens and the film goes in the back and as long as that shutter is closed the film is not being exposed. But if you take this front cover off of this camera body if there were film in here, you would be able to see the film through there. So you, there's no way you can take a lens off in the middle of shooting and put on a different lens. You'll, you'll expose light to your whole roll of film and you'll have ruined everything. So it's important to know, to know what lens you're going to use before you start shooting. And mount that lens and then, then uh, install your film or load your film and then you're off and shooting finish up if you decide to go from 90 to 180, finish up that roll and then move on to the, then load up your, uh, after taking that roll out, load up your 180 and start shooting again. So that's it. That's the Fuji GX617 panorama film camera with the 90 millimeter 5.6 and the 180 6.7 lens, both by Fuji. Phenomenal optics. Uh, the price point for these cameras used is very reasonable and the image quality is amazing. The last thing you need to know is that you have to have your film processed, of course, and then if you want to turn it into digital film, you have to have it scanned. You can do that on a FlexTot sc scanner or an Emicon. Uh, you can send it off to various labs and they'll scan panorama transparencies for you. Uh, but it is important that it's done right. Uh, labs charge anywhere from $10 to uh, $100 per scan depending on the DPI of the scan. 
and uh, so it's important to know what you're going to do before you purchase the camera and know that there's other cost. It's not like shooting digital to where you shoot all day long and everything's free at the end of the day. There is a subsequent cost, processing of the film and scanning of the film if you don't have your own scanner. But other than that, the, the results are amazing. It's a fun camera to use. I highly recommend it uh, and you will enjoy it immensely. So thank you for joining us today and we'll post up some images so you can see what this camera will produce.